Hi everyone, Sean Paul Ellis here from the Saturday Morning Cartoons Podcast. Remember, that's morning with a U. What are we chatting about in today's pre-show? Well, we have a correction for this episode. <laughs> Birthday shout-outs for myself. Shout-outs to listeners. And what are we going to be listening to on today's episode as we discuss she Princess of Power? For corrections, at some point in today's episode, I say that the cartoon The Herculoids came out in the late 70s. Oh boy, could I have not have been more wrong? Came out in 1967 to be exact. I goofed. Correction alert over. Depending on when you're listening to this, my birthday is this week. And I will no longer be able to say that I am a 37-year-old watching cartoons from when I was a kid as I Gran Torino myself on this show. I'm not talking about Clint Eastwood in the movie Gran Torino. I'm talking about the character from My Hero Academia. Want to get me a present? Oh, you shouldn't have. You are too kind. Honestly, no. All you have to do is share this episode. Share this episode on social media or go to iTunes and rate this show. Don't know what to say on iTunes? Don't worry. I'm going to give you something right now. Use the title birthday and the review can simply say, happy birthday, old man Sean. We're doing this because you told us to. That simple. However you decide to celebrate, thank you. Speaking of thank yous, we have some shout outs. The following people have messaged me after our He-Man episode. And so we want to be able to, to give them a shout out for all of their good work that they've done and just for dropping us some message. Mark Allen on Facebook had some awesome insight about Tila, the history of Tila's character and how it's tied into the mini comics and how possibly Skeletor is actually her legitimate dad. It's weird, gang. Great insight from Mark Allen. Thank you. I posed the question, what is your favorite PSA? What is your most memorable PSA from some of these shows? And a lot of you messaged that it is the Your Body PSA between He-Man and She-Ra. So thank you to Doug Kendall and Lily Axif for throwing that out there. I appreciate that. It was great to be able to watch some of these PSAs. It's great to also get your input about what your favorite PSAs are. So make sure you message us about the She-Ra PSAs or He-Man throughout the entire month. We're going to be posting them throughout July. Doug Kendall also reminded me about the dragon character that's in He-Man called Granamir and how weird Ram Man's character is in the show with catchphrases. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. Phil Ritty said that his favorite PSA is the one that they had that's about the importance of rehearsal always in forever. Thank you, Phil. We appreciate your comment on Twitter. Joshua Ray had a great non Shira slash He-Man PSA with the cartoon All-Stars to the Rescue episode that they have. Uh, this looks awesome, Joshua. Thank you so much. I think that this actually deserves a watch because we could do an entire new drug episode on this, which, you know, we've been overdue for one. So it's been uh, over 150 episodes, I think, since we've done our last one. So I think it's time. I think it's time. Dome Poltave. Had a great recommendation on Bionic 6. Actually, we've had a lot of you who have messaged that you are interested in having us watch Bionic 6. So don't worry, it's now on the list. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Dome. Appreciate the suggestion. So thank you all for who have messaged us, who have suggested and recommended stuff for us to watch. Want to shout out on one of our August episodes? Just message us on social media or email us at SaturdayMorningCartoons at gmail.com. So what are we in store for today? We have... Lura Barber returning to the show. You might remember Lura from our Herculoids episode as well as also our drug PSA two-parter episode that we did a long time ago. We also have newcomer, performer, and podcaster Ryan Kroll from the podcast Homo Superior. Both of my co-hosts have deep nostalgic roots with She-Ra. So today's episode is essentially going to be the opposite of what you may have heard for our He-Man episode earlier this month. Topics include the strength of inclusion of fan service for equestrians out there, iconic mustaches, and what it would be like to date Cringer. Yes, Cringer. <laughs> All of this and more on today's episode. Enjoy She-Ra, Princess of Power.
Hello, and welcome to Saturday Morning Cartoons, the weekly podcast that revisits, reviews, and ridicules some of the world's weirdest animated series. Coming to you all the way from Etheria, I'll be your host, Sean Paul Ellis. Peeking from the Whispering Woods, we have returning rebel, performer, and director, Lura Barber. Hello, Sean. Hi, Lura. Also, what's that? Flying in on a rainbow pegacorn, <laughs> we have performer, giggler, and podcaster, Ryan Kroll. Oh, by the power of gay skull, I'm here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invite. Of course, man. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, uh, we are obviously talking about a show that I believe is near and dear to, to some of our hearts. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, I feel like we could not have done the month of July talking about He-Man Without talking about literally the sister show, uh, yeah. <laughs> which is Shira, Princess of Power, um, I, I I think it's always curious because you know we we've had a lot of people. In fact, we had a, a listener of our He Man episode, a friend of the show EJ, who when we published the episode reached out and commented, and his his direct idea was, "Holy fuck, I haven't thought about some of this shit in twenty five years. Mm-hmm. This is amazing." And so uh, these. These two shows, these two complementary shows, I feel really do a great job of resonating with a lot of people. Yeah. And when I thought He-Man, there was absolutely no way that we could put this off. So I, I cannot wait to get into this. <laughs> but I, I want to ask, first and foremost, what what were your relationships with She-Ra? How did this kind of relate to you growing up? And so, Laura, I wanted to ask you first. Well, Sean, uh, this is my fifth time on the podcast. <laughs> Five happy timers fifth, Laura. club. Happy, happy, fifth. happy fifth. <laughs> yeah, I think this is the Pinot Grigio anniversary. Yes. Um, <laughs> and you know, my experience has generally been like I don't know the cartoons that we're talking about before I agree to be on the show, and then I watch them, and <laughs> you and whoever else is on the show are like really into it, and I'm like, I don't get it. This was different because Shira was my OG childhood hero in. Right? Like, I was born in 1981, so it was, like, the sweet spot for me. It was, like, five-ish when this show was at its peak. I didn't really care about He-Man. I was aware of He-Man. But She-Ra was my girl. I was obsessed. I wanted the figurines, the little five-inchers, yeah. you know? Not only of She-Ra, I had some of her sidekicks, which was very rare. I never got, like, a... Uh, the, the Barbie sidekick. So I was like, I need a Barbie. I need. You didn't need a skipper. I don't need a skipper. I, need a skipper. I don't need a Midge. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't even know who Midge is. Um, maybe I made Midge up. That um, don't sound real. <laughs> <laughs> I was really into She-Ra, and uh, for Christmas when I was five, I got the full She-Ra costume, which had wrist gauntlets, a belt a shield, the Shira kind of Valkyrie headdress, mm. and the sword. Nice. Mm. And it was like, I remember tearing it open and putting it on, and there's this photo of me like holding the sword aloft. And in that moment, I felt like I was Shira. That's awesome. So this was really fun to revisit. And I, I hadn't thought about it in a really long time, but this was like, uh, you know, take me back. Perfect. Yeah. Loved it. Awesome. Awesome. Ryan, what was your what was your experience with She-Ra? So I've always been a Saturday morning cartoons kid, like always growing up. Um, so I was born in 87. So I actually did miss the She-Ra boat when it actually came out. But uh, sort of so my sort of way into cartoons were like the CW shout out to the WB frog. Um, and then Mich- all, Michigan J. Uh, Frog. Uh, okay, maybe not shout out to him. <laughs> Problematic. Um, uh, so, uh, so it was CW, it was Fox Kids, it was a lot of that. Uh, but as I basically consumed all of that media, I was craving more and more and more cartoons. So uh, my sister, who's five years older than me, actually was into He-Man and She-Ra. So uh, she actually showed me She-Ra, and I was obsessed uh i freaked out um but being a little gay boy in florida it was a little bit tough like you didn't want to lean in too much to she-ra so i had to also latch on to he-man 
which uh, in retrospect actually made me a little bit gayer, I would say, <laughs> um, especially <laughs> outfits wise. It's uh, so it, it's a weird sort of dichotomy that I've always had to have where I had to both be into the boy toys, but also the I was secretly into the girl toys just as much, if not more. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I really got into the toys aspect of it. And then um, when you basically said we're doing it on She-Ra or She-Ra, uh, She-Ra, um, <laughs> as you might say, She-Ra. <laughs> uh, I was really excited and I really did not know how much I was into it. And I, it really made me flash back to that little boy, like mm-hmm. insanely, like, and I'll go into a bunch of like little things, but like, e- yeah, there was a lot there that I <laughs> didn't touch for a lot of years. I, I think the craziest thing about kind of talking about some of these these cartoons just holistically is that moment that you're saying of just being magically transported back to your youth oh to, to have that experience. That's that's so much fun because, you know, over 200 episodes that we've now done for Saturday Morning Cartoons, the craziest thing that we have is we'll have that reaction, but we'll also have reactions where you will have that nostalgia. You'll have that anchor where you're like, oh, fuck yes. And for me, the example is Voltron, Voltron 84 of I love this show when I was a kid this is the best and then when it came out I was like oh no this is terrible (laughs) (laughs) I'm not enjoying this at all and 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 there's a part of me that's like I really wish that I would have kept that that nostalgia that frame of reference sort of in the back Mm -hmm. of my mind I wouldn't have revisited it yeah Uh, but there's another part that you know for this show it's important to kind of go back and and check that out I'm glad that both of you had such good experiences with Mm -hmm. it Plus, I think it's really hard sometimes to not only say She-Ra, but also He-Man, and for He-Man not do the like He-Man, and then for She-Ra as we've been doing mm-hmm. She-Ra, She-Ra, She-Ra. All right, that's perfect. That's exactly what it is. It's, I think it's hard sometimes to to hear that, especially with the theme song and everything that's kind yeah. of associated with it, mm-hmm. to really dig into it. Mm-hmm. I, the crazy thing about She-Ra for me is that I was aware that it existed and I knew about it. I think my cousin had some toys. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't really remember like, I, cause I was born in 80 mm-hmm. and so I was, I was around during this sweet spot. And as I talked about last week on the He-Man episode, I had a ton of these toys. Like my parents were, were very kind. If I had a cartoon that I was really into, uh, they were very supportive. They would buy me action figures for it. And plus I was probably me crying in some department store somewhere, like you throwing a tantrum and they're like, all right, let's just throw two more characters in the car and mm-hmm. yeah. get him home. So we don't have to deal with them. At at the same time, I I knew that She-Ra existed, but today was kind of really interesting because I feel like there were a lot of moments and a lot of lessons that She-Ra learned from He-Man. And having watched Mm. both of these shows so close together, I kind of feel my preliminary thought is that She-Ra is actually the stronger of the two cartoons. Mm -hmm. And and I I think that there's a lot more to be said in terms of uh, not only the the feminist outlook that's in this cartoon, but also the more progressive outlook that they have with some of the character choices and the fact that kind of her cadre is pretty much female dominated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with -hmm. with the exception of a unicorn weird owl Mm -hmm. and uh, and a dude named Bo, which is not spelled like... Bo, like B E A U. Hey, you're, yeah, oh. You're, you're oh, you're my bow. This is like oh no, you're a you're a tool. Yeah, you're a, you're a weapon. They B O W and you shoot a B O W. Yeah, and his horse is aptly named Arrow. Yeah, really Great stuff. Yes, I missed that. Yeah. But weirdly enough, his dad is also named Bo. <laughs> his mom is named Bo as well. They're all named Bo. It's a family of bows. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't. Know. That would just I be... didn't watch that one. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I was like, ooh, I gotta read that Wikipedia entry. <laughs> that would be the laziest writing in the uh... history of cartoons. Look, it's just a family of bows. That's all we got. We're done. Fair enough. I have so many thoughts on bow. Oh, oh, we're gonna <laughs> get into it. Well, mm-hmm. before we do get into it, uh, I want to kind of give everybody, if you're not familiar with Shira, Princess get of Power, get familiar. Get familiar first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Second, let's give you a little bit of a history. She-Ra, Princess of Power, is an American animated series produced in 1985 by Filmation. A spinoff of Filmation's He-Man, Masters of the Universe series, She-Ra was aimed primarily at young female audiences to complement He-Man's popularity with young males. Unlike the He-Man cartoon, which was based on the Masters of the Universe toy line by Mattel, the creation of She-Ra was a collaboration between Filmation and Mattel. 
the initial group of characters and premise were created by Filmation, while the characters introduced later were designed by Mattel. Mattel provided the financial backing for the series as well as an accompanying toy line. The series premiered in 1985 and was canceled in 1986 after two seasons and 93 episodes, which (laughs) is actually great. Insane amount of episodes. (laughs) Seven short of syndication. (laughs) Actually, for cartoon syndication, Mm. it crosses the line. Cartoon syndication is 65 episodes. So that's why you will see a lot of 80s cartoons, one season, 65 episodes. And by the end of Mm -hmm. the 65-episode run, they are squeezing blood from a stone. (laughs) It is like, let's do another clip show. Remember that time that we did episode one? And you're like, stop it. Mm -hmm. Just really stop it. So on March 2nd, 1985, Filmation released an animated film based on the series titled He-Man and She-Ra, The Secret of the Sword. The film is composed of five episodes from the She-Ra television series into Etheria, which we watched for tonight, Beast Island, She-Ra Unchained, Reunions, and The Fight for Bright Moon. This is exciting news. On December 12th, 2017, DreamWorks Animation and Netflix announced a new reboot series based on She-Ra. The series will be executive produced by award-winning author Noelle Stevenson, who created Nimona and Lumberjanes. It is a project uh, that is projected to be released sometime in 2018, so this year, guys. I'm really excited. I am, too. I'm so pumped. Let's Uh, have mm -hmm. a watch party, please. (laughs) I I would do that. I would do that. Mm -hmm. If if you know anything about Netflix and DreamWorks Animation, they are crushing it right now, and so uh, I... I'm 100% on board with whatever direction they decide mm-hmm. to go with mm-hmm. She-Ra. Even if it's crazy, mm-hmm. I would be, I'd be 100% behind this. Speaking of which, the cast was revealed on May 18th of 2018 alongside a poster and the official series title, She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. So there might be more princesses in this. More princesses, guys. Kind of taking that Disney lead, mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah, a little bit. Giving, I want- giving every little girl somebody and little boy yeah, something thank to you. look up to. Um, I wanted more witches personally, but mm. we'll get into that. I'm going to be honest. I wanted more animated <laughs> household cleaning objects, like broom, <laughs> dustpan. Soap. Yeah. Update it. Where's Swiffer? Where is she? <laughs> yeah. I don't care how many characters there are, as long as they're voiced by the same three actors. <laughs> I have a feeling they will be. Uh, you know, surprisingly, I, you know, I, I, I think it would be funny to have a cartoon kind of like this. I mean, so many 80s and 90s cartoons had a very limited small mm-hmm. voice cast where people played multiple roles. Yeah. Something like that in the modern day, I think would be silly and insane to do. We have so many talented voice actors that are out there and we have a lot more mainstream actors that are coming over to do via mm-hmm. work because they're they're understanding the popularity or the fact that they have these mega fandoms that are behind this IP and they're like, oh, we... In some ways, it's sort of, I want to do this because I think it's interesting work. In other ways, there's a part of my brain that's like, it's a business, so it's a cash grab. When so. you say IP, do you mean intellectual property? I do, correct. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to check in. I meant internet protocol. A lot of people that are interested <laughs> in internet protocols. There's this whole WWW. The real <laughs> crossover audience here. <laughs> <laughs> of like tech nerds and people who are like intellectual property lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So... Uh, we've talked a little bit about the the history of the show, but if you are coming into She-Ra again cold, as Laura said earlier, mm-hmm. get into it. But we're also going to give you guys a little bit of a synopsis, too. All right. She-Ra follows the adventures of Princess Adora, Prince Adam slash He-Man's twin sister, who leads a group of freedom fighters known as the Great Rebellion in the fight to free Etheria from the tyrannical rule of Hordak. And the evil horde. Mm-hmm. With her sword of protection, Adora can become She-Ra. She-Ra! She-Ra! <laughs> Just blasted the levels. <laughs> Just as Prince Adam can become He-Man. Born on planet Eternia to Queen Marlena and King Randor, Princess Adora is kidnapped at birth by Hordak and taken to Etheria. There she serves as a mind-controlled horde force captain. <laughs> Be careful he- with your words. Horde. <laughs> horde force is another cartoon. <laughs> a mind-controlled horde force captain before He-Man rescues her. After reuniting with her parents on Eternia, She-Ra decides to return to Etheria and lead the Great Rebellion. Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. So 
We should mention that for tonight's episode, if you guys are listening and you want to have a little bit of context of what we watched, we watched season one, episode one, Into Etheria. This is interesting because as uh, as we mentioned, this is the part one of a five-part series. So the, the Secret of the Sword with He-Man and She-Ra was then cut up into five separate episodes, as we mentioned previously. So we only watched really just the first one. I know that Ryan and I have watched a couple other episodes that are along uh, the lines because... I don't know. We're overachievers and we just super had some, fans, yeah. super fans. We had some time. <laughs> I have other hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but we also watched season two, episode 14, which was the uh, highest rated episode on IMDb, which is called assault on the hive. Mm-hmm. And so, which is going to be interesting. And, and I think going to provide an interesting contrast in terms of uh, those two specific episodes in terms of voice and tone. So I can't wait to kind of get into this. Mm-hmm. But we can't get into everything until we start talking about theme song. This is the this sets the mood. It sets the tone of Whoa. everything mm-hmm. that's involved. Yeah. Yes, the theme it's song. It's so 80s, but like with a Giorgio Moroder 1970s <laughs> disco like influence. Wow. You talk about catchy. Mm. This is one of the catch Screw He Man. He Man, who oh, cares? Who cares? This is so much catchier than He Man. He Man is bullshit. They have, they have to throw in the Masters mm-hmm. of the Evil or whatever it is. Universe. Universe. <laughs> I knew what it was. I'm just being mean to him. But yeah. like, they they have to throw that in, mm-hmm. and it is awful. Like, I yeah. feel it throws it all off. She can just be her. You know, the theme song is different between the two episodes. Because the first uh, season one, episode one, it's very He Man influence. It's like a masculine voice announcing it. By the time you get to season two, episode 14, it's the voice of She-Ra, which is also a little bit different. Yeah. Right. Um, and it is first person. I am Adora. And it's like this very female power centric yeah. kind of presentation. She puts that sword up, the sparkles come down, and she becomes She-Ra. It's very powerful. It is. It's yeah. crazy. Uh, mm-hmm. I felt a lot, and just seeing the transformation of it, uh, even within season one and then it, later in season two, it's it's very different. And I mm-hmm. love it. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel things in such I a kinda way. I kind of want to watch the season two, episode 14 style intro, like before I have to give a presentation or something. Oh my God. Wouldn't it feel pump so you out? Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. Will, we will talk about sort of, because there, there is a definite filmation sort of a standard that they have for some of their characters. Yeah. which is also good to do mm. body language wise before you give a presentation that we'll kind of talk about. And uh-huh. exactly. And so uh, it, I it's... just, I just did a power pose. If anybody <laughs> is familiar, <laughs> hands on hips. <laughs> if, if you, if you put your hands on hips, uh, mm-hmm. we have a, we have a friend of the show. His name is Chris Ulrich, who is a mm-hmm. body language expert. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he will always tell you that if you're about to do a presentation, if you're about to get up in front of a, an, a large audience, to put your hands on your hip in that sort of Superman pose yeah. mm-hmm. uh, because it, it's supposed to kind of prepare your, your mind, get you ready. It's, it's a real power stance. So uh, something to not do is like grab the nearest sword, hold it up in the air and scream things and then change your outfit. <laughs> well, that, Cause that... I did that <laughs> right before each performance. <laughs> Well, I mean that that's a that's a power move. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's a difference between a power stance and a power move. Mm. Like you were definitely getting ready to let everybody yeah. know Ryan is here. Mm-hmm. Step mm-hmm. the fuck away. You're gonna look at this PowerPoint. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I've got my sword out. <laughs> Not weird at all. Lara, anything else from you about the the theme song? I think everything from the initial the filmation <laughs> intro where it's like to the end of the song is like pure childhood memory drug like shooting right through my veins (laughs) and i'm just like in nostalgia like just soaking in it right totally yeah and it's like i can like smell the house i lived in when i was that age like there's just like so many like sensory memories that come flooding back like the smell of the toys the, yeah. the, the plastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we watched that uh, documentary on Netflix, The Toys That Made Us. Mm-hmm. Mm. And they showed some of those toys. And I just remember, like, how friggin' flimsy they were. Oh. You know, and they're tiny and you'd get so excited. Yeah. And then you'd, you'd I mean, my parents would not give in to tantrums. They, you were like, you very rarely got, you know, it was like your birthday, it was Christmas. 
and very special occasions. And then I remember getting one of her sidekicks that had like a, a flower that came out somehow. It was made of fabric, you know, and it was, and then you're just like, Oh, just the fabric comes out and goes back in. The fabric <laughs> comes back yeah. in. Oh. You know, it's, but it, I mean, as advertised, but yeah. it's one of the, I think that was kind of like one of my first lessons in, um, my expectations not matching reality. Yeah. I, I remember getting a bunch of them and being like, well, these arms don't move. So I guess he'll just always have his hands up he, screaming yay mm-hmm, or whatever. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. A lot of my Power Rangers. They, their yeah. hair was not, they had some hair, but it was not enough to braid. Mm-mm. Really? Right. Yeah. Not like a. I never quite wrap my hands around any of like, uh, what some would call like the girl toys where mm-hmm. you can actually have active hair that you can right. touch and like feel. And man, did I want it. Yeah. Man, did I want that well, hair. And, and, you know, cause I wasn't into He-Man. I'm going to, I'm off on a little tangent here no, for no, a second. I wasn't into He-Man and my brother. So I had, I'm the oldest. My brother is four years younger. So he was too young to be into He-Man. He-Man was not really in my universe, so to speak. And so it was like, if you want, if you were playing with all your dolls, You'd be like, okay, Shira and Ken are gonna like go on a date, and like yeah. Ken is like so tall, and she was like, Shira, Shira. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had Jem, which mm. was a taller than Barbie, and you're just like, she's truly outrageous, oh. truly, truly, truly outrageous. Whoa, <laughs> Jem, yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a str- a not a not insignificant portion of my brain dedicated to to my- just Jem. Gem. Um, <laughs> I think I did the gem episode. For listeners out there, the, uh, Lura did episode 49 and 50 with us that were talking about drug PSAs. Mm-hmm. And so there was a, a sort of a, a suicide awareness PSA that they had with a woman who was threatening to jump off the top of the house that they lived in. Mm-hmm. So, and that mm-hmm. was in gem. Oh. It was in gem. Yeah. Gem. True. So kind of, kind of, it was, yeah. it was very scary. Good Suffice it to say so, at the end of it, she did not jump. They rescued mm-hmm, her. She was mm-hmm. okay. So I have a question for the two of you because you watch a lot more cartoons as adults than I do. Sure. Mm-hmm. Do cartoons these days do this thing that cartoons in the eighties did where they would tackle suicide or drugs mm. or your parents divorcing or whatever? In special episodes? It feels very different now. It's not as heavy-handed. They don't stop the episode at the very end in a Marvel-esque sort of after like show Mm -hmm. thing and be like, kids. You're not going to get the after-school special. Um, But I I would say they tackle it in more subtle ways now, which Mm -hmm. is kind of nice and probably more conversational without being heavy-handed. Right. I'd say that more of... The and, and I guess the only the only example that I can think of right off my head that I know that we've talked about has been Steven Universe and sort of uh, the ideas of sort of acceptance, depression. I, but I don't think they've had anything that's really been on there in accordance with like drugs or uh, I know that there there are, there are a lot of Shira He Man PSAs that they have that are out there mm-hmm. that range anywhere from making sure that you uh, prepare before you're doing something all the way up to bad touching. And so, and like everything in between. So I don't feel, and I, I agree with Ryan that I don't think that they're as heavy handed as they have been. Uh, but I think that, you know, some cartoons lately have been doing a good job of kind of like showing exactly what's been going on mm-hmm. or sort of putting you in the specific situation mm-hmm. that you can kind of understand exactly what that character is going through as opposed to like breaking that fourth wall and, and making that comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I think they're not at, they're more story driven now. It's not more of a, like a, like it's not like lesson. a special episode. Exactly. It's just I part of the really show. Anymore, which yeah. is kind of yeah. sad. I kind of miss it in some way. Yeah, it, it's challenging because I, I think that there's a lot of cartoons that are out there right now. Like we, mm-hmm. we when Lura came on and, and talked about sort of the, the drug episodes, we had one specifically that was in a, a television show, a cartoon called Brave Star, uh, where they, they have a drug episode where at the very end this kid who's taking drugs dies. Like I can't think in modern times – uh, people who have been taking drugs and cartoons mm-hmm. that have had that sort of stake put over them. I feel like a yeah. lot of times what we do now is that we've become so inundated with those comments or those things that are happening that it becomes oversaturated. And then that kind of maybe like drug culture of people taking pills or, or snorting something, they're like, oh no, now we have superpowers. Or like, now we're, now yeah. we're, uh, now we're rock stars. And it's like, oh, yeah, I, I, I don't see th- the gravity of it anymore. I also think we're in a post dare 
world, you know, where we learned in drug abuse resistance education <laughs> that it was sort of like any drug is bad. They're all right. kind of equally bad, whether you're talking about uh, taking an edible, um, you know, or shooting heroin into your eyeball. It was all kind of like all one and the same and they could all kill you. Um, and I think that there has been a movement in drug education away from that kind of messaging because it kind of gives people a sense of like, well, if I do this, like if I'm doing this, then I might as well do that. You know, if yeah, I'm, yeah. and what's the difference? And then people smoke a joint and they're like, I just feel kind of silly and I want to eat a brownie. Yeah. And uh, you lied to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it becomes this cognitive dissonance that creates distrust and. Plus, I think the way we, uh, like, especially kids now consume media, it's mm -hmm. very fast. And they're, they're not going to sit through, like, 30 minutes of a show. Even, like, a little kid on their iPad is not going to sit through 30 minutes mm. and then wait for the lesson at the end. They yeah. need it, like, right away. I think it's much, it's a faster impact thing. Not that it can't influence, like, older mm -hmm. audiences, but I, I just don't think we consume media in the same way. That's true. Right. I was watching cartoons with my three-year-old niece recently. I, we are on such a tangent. No, 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 no. <laughs> and I was just like, what the fuck is going on? We were watching some cartoons on Netflix, kids. Which one? I, d I don't remember. Honestly, my, my brother and his wife put the volume down really low. So she almost doesn't even, my niece doesn't realize that cartoons have like, Dialogue and sound. Dialogue and sound. <laughs> oh, she just oh, watches no. them. Like, she loves that. She loves the Lorax. I mean, they have the volume set at like three with the closed captioning. She can't read. <laughs> you know? That's just an insult. That's just an insult but, to everybody. But she loves it. She oh. loves it. So I'm reading the closed captioning on this cartoon. I'm just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> and you know? It, it's and it's Dr. Seuss uh, rhyming about taking drugs. Yeah. And it's like kids and, yeah, it, I don't even know what it was. And, and I'm sure in 30 years she'll be on a, some podcast or whatever they have then being like, well, remember when we watched that show? Apollo spheres. And it, I'll, yeah. be a, I'll be a, a brain like, <laughs> in pickled, a jar, pickled yeah. in a jar. I, I, there's a part of me that kind of hopes that in the future that my kids will have a podcast that's mm -hmm. just listening to episodes of a podcast that I was on. <laughs> And commenting about how much of an asshole their father yes. is. That is so self-centered. It is. It's 100%. That's, oh. I'm having children because I am self-centered. I don't have children now, <laughs> yes. but in the future when I do, it's for self-centered reasons. We could only yeah. hope they're talking about us later. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So I wanted to check and see. Uh, Ryan, did you have any additional comments or thoughts about the theme song? Yeah, theme songs are a big thing for me. Um, I, it harkens back to my day of loving cartoons, but also loving just like the sitcom-based sort of intro. I love it. I love when someone spins around and has arms on their shoulders and you just see their real name. I fucking love that. So like Too Many Cooks is so in my like headspace. I love it so, ma so much. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that type of like transformative sort of uh, things that heroes do as well. So I was a big Power Rangers fan back in the day. So the fact that they have these transformations with these swords where they're just screaming at the top of their lungs, <laughs> but yet no one can hear them. Um, mm -hmm. I, oh, I'm behind a rock. Let me scream and then just mm -hmm. transform and or, no one will know. Yeah. And in Gem, she's like, you know, synergy. Yeah. <laughs> touches her earring people yeah. are like what yeah that it was always problematic mm -hmm. and you're like you still look like jam um but uh <laughs> yeah so uh, but i love that transformative sort of thing mm -hmm. and i just love the idea of like a new outfit really gives me all these powers like because nothing else happens like you don't really get muscle mass or any like it's, it's so crazy so i'm all on board for the this super over the top theme song as well as like the transformations that happen. Uh, one other thing that really spoke to me just uh, quickly that had me really had to uh, overanalyze my life was uh, one of the lines both for He-Man and She-Ra is that it's fabulous, uh, fabulous secrets were revealed to me. And I'm like, <laughs> well, tell me more. Like uh, now I want to know. <laughs> fabulous secrets. <laughs> it's yeah. And, and then they make a point in both shows that are like only three people know about this. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I wonder if like, if I saw Adora, would she tell me? Like, I want to know. Mm. Yeah. 
I just love that aspect of it. I, I, yeah. I think that, that that's probably... Speaks volumes to me. I, I, it, it's crazy because the thing for the theme song, <laughs> so the, the comparison that we've had with the He-Man theme song is that it's not really as much of a theme song as more as... It, it, it's sort of a narrative to sort of set the mood, and there's sort of the chant of He-Man mm-hmm. or She-Ra in the background, which is really the only sing-songy portion to kind yeah. of like set the stage. But there is like really rousing music that kind of pumps you up and gets you ready. You know, it's sort of like the jock jams of Eternia <laughs> or Etheria to yeah. like get you ready to, to go for this. It's a lot of fun. And I think it also does a great job just narrative wise of telling you as the kid exactly who's bad and who's evil. And that mm-hmm. I think is always a, a good hallmark of, of storytelling right out of the gate is like, who am I rooting for? Who am I, who am I going to scream against? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and they, they do a good job in terms of color theory, which we'll talk about when we get to characters of being able to make that distinction, which is always really fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, letting you in on sort of the the secret, I think, is a big thing, as you were talking about, mm-hmm. Ryan, of just like, mm-hmm. here's this transformation, but there's a handful of people who really know what's going on, which is very confusing, I want to say, for She-Ra. For He-Man, we get it kind of like right out of the gate. It's like, here are the handful of people that we have it's Orko, this weird wizard. Yes, we have uh, Man at Arms, who's <laughs> kind of like training him for for battle, and we have the Sorceress. For this, we have L- uh, Light Hope, Madam Raz, and Cowl. But we're mm-hmm. never introduced to Light Hope until a little bit later on. Uh, which I is- thought it was never we were introduced to it. Is that the Owl? No, that is the first image of like you just see like a weird light, just a street mm, light in the yeah. very first thing. Got very it. strange. Is that the the vulva shaped yes. portal? <laughs> yes. That's the one. I'm yes. always bringing vulvas into my commentary. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because you know, you you realize in terms of that transformation as we have with with He-Man where it's really just him taking off his clothes and holding a sword. With, with She-Ra, it's just a little bit more costuming than what she has right now, a headdress and a sword. And so there's a part of me that kind of thinks, are these rebels just not that observant in terms of what they're doing? Or are they just like, you know what? She's playing a game and we're all along with her because she's a badass with this sword yeah. and we're all on board. And so I'm just going to go along with this game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, as, well, long, I, I, as long as she wants to do this, we're cool with it. I know. Like, I would love a very special mm. episode where they're all like, so we know she's she right? And just they're like, <laughs> come on, guys. Or like, yeah. She-Ra and He-Man are on a mission, and everybody else is like, so... They're just like yeah, at just, a TGI Friday. It's just like... Eating down. mozzarella sticks. <laughs> Jalapeno poppers. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, can I get real for a minute? <laughs> Oh, dearie my. Can I get real? Mad- <laughs> Madam Raz is like two mudslides in. Oh, and she's oh, like, oh yeah. Mudslides are Madam Raz's drink yeah. for sure. <laughs> Broom showed up drunk. That was yeah. the problem, though. That was the problem. Broom is yeah. just real skinny uh, and doesn't know his limits. God damn it. Drink a water. Yeah. He's drinking lemon drops. <laughs> <laughs> lemon drop shots. So, you know, one of the one of the interesting things that we talked about uh, from episode one to episode three, mm. we sort of had this narration at the top where it kind of begins this male narration, this male narration voice who really digs in and says, like, where darkness rules, fights the champion of light, where hope seems lost, there rides the rebellion. And he he kind of really digs in. And then finally, we sort of get the she Princess of Power sort of echoing in the background to kind of lead you into the episode. but. Yeah. He's staging you on, and then finally in that fourth episode, after she is revealed and understands what her her fabulous powers are that are revealed to her, (laughs) you sort of now have this moment where she comes in that we've talked about, which is like, I am Adora. And you're like, awesome, great. This is is what I want. And it almost mirrors one for one what He-Man goes through. And when you think about it, I think it's challenging because she will kind of always be in the footsteps of He-Man simply because he came first and it was such a, a success and it was, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a way to make money and it was a way to churn out toys, you know, and story was kind of second. I love the fact that she though, takes that step further and I think it does a better job storytelling. I completely agree. I, I was so worried, especially when I was watching the first episode, that she, she was just going to get caught in He-Man sort of like, oh, when something actually bad happens, He-Man needs to come back and help her. But it's very much not that. 
And as you, as you watch like the later uh, actual episodes, you can see her coming into her own. She's making motivational speeches all left right. and right. Mm-hmm. Like she's she's doing it for herself. And she's like, if this is a problem, she'll call He-Man every once in a while. But otherwise, she's got it. It, it, I think it's also interesting, too, to sort of see that interaction that they have where at mm-hmm. one point in one of the episodes tonight, she reaches out and she's like, you know what? This is going on. Uh, it's with a bad guy from your planet. <laughs> if you would like to join us, greatly appreciated. Yeah. And what is He-Man doing when she reaches out to him? There's like, he's... I have a few theories. He, he, he's fishing, but we'll, we'll get into yeah, that. That's right. we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into it in He's a fishing with Cringer. My, my uh, right? Cringer is so problematic. Oh. What a mess. Speaking of problematic for some people, mm. let's dig into animation style. Animation okay. style with filmation is, is something that is notorious for a lot of people. And so, Laura, what were your thoughts about the animation style for She-Ra? Well, I'm biased because this is so imprinted on my brain. <laughs> this whole style, you know, it's it's weird when you go back now as an adult and realize how formative this complete shit is for you. <laughs> You're like, oh, the bedrock of my taste is like complete shit. Cool. Um, you know, but it's... It's a very, um, okay, you've got your your background, you know, sell, and then the people run. It's very herky-jerky. It's definitely done on a budget. Um, it's definitely kind of a, we can do th- five episodes for the price of three kind yes. of aesthetic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of the female characters have an identical body. Um, I mean, and, and, and you do know why that that is, correct? Well, I don't know. So it's actually because all the, women look alike. No, <laughs> I dare you, Sean. <laughs> no, it, say it. It, it, it. It's challenging because there, there is, there's obviously a portion of this that was selling toys, and so what happens is that it's cast one mold, correct? And yeah. so what they would do is they would they would kit bash those different molds to create. Kit. So it's it's adding different components or like different mm. uh, unique things onto that female. Got so it. like if you look at Tila. From He Man, mm-hmm. yeah. she is almost the exact same mold as Adora. Do you feel like this is just a product of misogyny and capitalism uh, I, in an unholy union? I, I, would, I would say yes. I think the challenging thing too is that if you look at a lot of the He Man characters mm-hmm. that they have too, it's the same body type as well. I mean, it, uh, when will when will when will Manticore men and mermen get their due? <laughs> Guys, I'm not going to apologize for looking like He Man, by the way. <laughs> nor nor should you. you I wanted to I wanted to say at the top of this you look great Ryan yeah, I'm wearing that leather harness that he's wearing actually uh, right now. Yeah. you're like a is, hey man, is, is, hey man. is zaddy the word <laughs> we don't use that anymore no 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 we're over that can we talk about costumes for a sec as long as we're here let's dig into it let's do what about so or do you want to reserve this for animation or for characters <sighs> oh, this is it's a comment in general let's yeah. get into it then so this is a show for children. 100%. 100% to sell children things. Everybody is dressed like some BDSM leather daddy, like mistress, like with a with a latex fetish. Yeah. It is 100, like any human-esque figure in this is yeah. like, if it's a woman, it's like a bustier and some like little panties and some some boots. Yeah. And knowing that I that this was created by a bunch of men and some of the women at Mattel, I'm just like, what's going like all of them like Bo. I'm Girl, looking Bo, I'm looking at yeah. Ryan. Bo that is tough mustache. To see, and it's not tough to see. Chest I was, harness I felt something when I looked at it. You know, <laughs> yeah. And Adam. Yeah. You know, and God damn it. And they're riding on a horse together. And, oh, oh my God. Yeah. We're that, gonna get into gay stuff later, but I feel geez, like you need to post oh, some yeah. gifts of Bo and I have Adam them. riding a horse. I have them. I have them. I'll send them to you. <laughs> I don't need to know yeah. why yeah. or I how you've used them. I have but... a close personal friend that said uh that that was one of the most influential like gay things that mm-hmm. happened in his entire life. Both Bo and Adam riding that horse together. Yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, wow. and I, and and it's I I'm really curious. So I'm going off on this tangent about like the outfits because it is kind of funny in these children's shows where there's like everybody's in their panties. Um, 
<laughs> no bad touch. Um, but also, it's like, how intentional is some of this queer subtext? Or, I mean, sometimes not even subtext. I'm like, this is this is pretty out there. So I, I think that the, the question I'm going to pose to you is a question mm. that uh, our performer and friend Isabel Galbraith posed to me last week. Mm -hmm. Is that Lura was... She posed the question to to Jason and I asking, uh, was He-Man like a sign or a symbol of masculinity? Like, was he something that like we looked at and we thought like, that's what a hero looks like. That's what, as a man, so the question that I have for you then is when you saw She-Ra, was this a symbol of femininity? Was this something that you looked at and you thought like, oh, I need to, I need to look up to this. This is sort of what I want. That is a really good question. I think the persona of She-Ra was like this vessel that I could inhabit and I could have this like powerful, you know, moment of glory, you know, in a way that as a child you don't really get because a child's life is kind of small. You're going to like kindergarten and, you know, playing like a pilgrim in the Thanksgiving play. It's not a lot of glory. But She-Ra is like glam. Right. There's a lot of like gold and sparkle. She's the boss. And she's like has this big moment, which is really great where she's like, you know, I am She-Ra, you know. Um, I can't really do the theme song. Um, or the price is right. That sounded yeah. like that sounded like uh, like a movie if they were using sound effects for like an, oh a, a news report's coming. Yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, breaking news. <laughs> oh, she President out. Lincoln yeah. has been shot <laughs> <laughs> by Shira. <laughs> oh my god, crossover. Shira's later. Oh my god. Years, yeah. Oh my god. Um, yeah. So so I wouldn't say I thought of her as like oh this is how one can be a woman. Mm. Sure. But it was like, this is some exciting shit for me. Yeah. Okay. You know? And like, in a way that nothing else is. Got it. Yeah. Uh, can I say, uh, being both uh, influenced by both of their outfits when they transform, <laughs> uh, I was very much having his sort of, I even as a boy, I believe I blushed when I saw He-Man because it was so outrageous, even yeah. for back then. It it's uh, it's like a harness. It is wet in homosexuality. It is like you can feel it when you touch the figure. Like it is, mm -hmm. it is, a, it is so, it is so prevalent. Um, and then her just being a beacon of power, which she's actually more covered up, which I really appreciate. So uh, identifying with kind of both of them was a weird sort of thing to try to incorporate into my life. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's actually, I think a lot of. Like little gay boys out there felt like fueled by both of these characters in a in a cool way. He man gets up probably a lot of slack for being sort of like the toxic masculinity, which he is. He was basically created by a bunch of like straight white guys, <laughs> straight white guys that uh, uh, were just trying to capitalize on toy sales, but. Uh, I think she really changed the game and like she became her own character. And so I, I think a lot of people tap into both of those together. And plus they have such a beautiful like sibling like relationship, which I love. Right. Right. Yeah. It's really lovely. It's nice. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to check yeah. and see, I wanted to cycle in with you, Ryan and check and see thoughts about animation. Yes. Um, animation, obviously, um, I'm getting a lot of gem in the holograms that came out at the same time. <laughs> a lot of bright colors. A lot of bright colors. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of crossover. I mean, if Glimmer had a crossover with Gem, I don't think anyone would bat an eye in like a second. She'd basically look like she's straight out of there. Um, uh, God damn, this animation, they love to run, don't they? Don't they just love to run? They really got that one mm -hmm. animation right, and they were playing that up. I feel like everyone... The, one thing, I, I was being more forgiving because I knew going into this, this was like mid-80s, early 80s animation where it was probably going to be problematic. Uh, and so I gave a lot of leeway to it, and I was actually really pleasantly surprised. I thought it was it held up a lot better. Um, you have a lot of still scenes or like uh, panning scenes where it's just ADR over it, where people are like, ah! and then it's like a castle, and you're like, what is happening? Yeah. 
Uh, but uh, which is fine because it's what they had to do at the time. But I think uh, I think they got a lot of things right. Actually, I think the the animation does kind of hold up in a kind of okay way. I would say having uh, been here for the Herculoids episode, it is so much like that's my like baseline level for animation <laughs> where it's like a rocket's shooting one direction and then they just like flip the cell and it should go <laughs> shooting in the other direction. <laughs> when when so, was Herculoids? Mm, when was that? Uh, it was uh, late 70s. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So I agree. Like it's kind of fun to watch and yeah. like the colors are very rich and in most cases, um, most cases, yeah, uh, I, so, they do love the mode of transportation though the most. Mm, oh my gosh, getting I, on a horse, we're gonna see the entire movie. Oh yeah, running to something, you're gonna see the entire movie. They love just action. Are like they the chasing something. somebody? You're gonna see start to finish, A to B. Yes. Yeah. Where did they get to? Well, you'll see. Yeah. You know, I, I think the interesting thing about filmation is that they are they are well known for doing less frames per second than what many animators will do. And so that is mm. kind of what ends up giving it that like jerky look. Yeah. Is it do less than twenty four frames per second. Mm. And so it, it 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 looks weird because a lot of it is like the keyframe animation that they have and sort of that that interstitial that sort of fleshes that out and makes it look like real movement doesn't exist. And so they filmation is well known for that. They're also really well known for reusing animation. So rockets going one way and then rockets going another way. She were running one way, she were running another way. They're mm-hmm. gonna reuse and get every they're gonna get mm-hmm. everything possible from that that one moment. They also do a lot of things as you were mentioning about long establishing shots, sometimes where they have like that ADR or they have sort of like sound effects that are going on over top of it. Uh, as a way to not only like establish mood, but also just cost saving measures. Because <laughs> there, there were there was, I, I will say in the second episode that we watched for tonight, there's definitely parts where they pan over an entire universe mm-hmm. and then they pan back, and you're like, where are you going with this one? Mm-hmm. Where, <laughs> where 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 are we going? We just we you you brought us to A to B, and now we're back at A. Damn it. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, that second episode with the beehive people, which we'll get into. Um, I think half of the episode just might be that shot of the beehive in space. I I, I have a time yeah. break. I have a time breakdown of what that episode <laughs> is, which is really, ins- which is oh insane God. for me because it's been, it's bonkers. I was so, I was watching the episode and somebody came down and was like looking at the screen like, is this a Devo video? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think the final thought that I have about animation that uh, is interesting, it's about color theory. And so there is Mm. this idea in color theory that uh, like with Roy G. Biv, the closer you get to the end of the spectrum with blue and violets, that tends to be where they assign a majority of the villains. Yes. And so you will notice with Skeletor, think about the colors Mm -hmm. he is. He's Mm -hmm. purple and he's blue. And so, you know, we have Hordak for this episode who mm-hmm. is very much along the same lines as those colors as well. We have a couple uh, colorful villains that we have that are in there that sort of uh, kind of go against the grain in terms of that rule. But at the same time, you can't have that kind of blanket palette of all bad guys with one color. And so they yeah. go for more aggressive colors with actually the females which is very interesting. They mm-hmm. give them a lot of reds. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. also uh, He-Man is getting a lot of purples, a lot, a of, lot pink. of pink, yeah. yeah, a lot of salmon. Yeah. Yeah. And that's interesting that they do that for the beginning, but then when he transforms, it's then it's like a lot of like gray and mm-hmm. it's a lot of red. So it, 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 but it's also at the same time, like it's a lot of skin, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And so it's the idea of like, he can bear his chest. Like he can be mm-hmm. this sign of masculinity, which he's almost naked. He can be this weird leather daddy for a couple minutes. Yeah. And people are like, Oh yeah. Like he's the weird body distorted image of what like a guy should consider, you know, something mm-hmm. that I'm going to go to the gym and like work up towards eventually. I'm like, yeah. Oh, I'm going to the gym hoping I just break even. Like, <laughs> I had a donut today. Like I'm hoping uh, to just be calorie negligent at the end of the day, which means I'm skipping meals. Uh, but you know, we, we kind of talked about Hordak and mm-hmm. we kind of talked about some of these other characters here. And so I know that this is something that you both really want to get into. And so I want to, I want to throw this out to you guys. Uh, Lura, who is your favorite character? My favorite character mm. And you can say She-Ra. That's totally, totally mm. acceptable to throw in there. I just think it's interesting because we are, at this point, I want to say we are almost inundated 
with characters that come on with mm-hmm. not only this first episode, but this the second episode that we watched for tonight. There are so many people. There are so many people. You spend the majority of season one, episode one, just absorbing the impact <laughs> of character after character coming at you. The voice is perhaps not as differentiated as you might hope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's a lot, you know, I have, I'm watching this and I'm, you know, I was like jotting some notes. I'm just like, I don't even know. Um, can you ask me your question again? <laughs> sure. So mm-hmm. what would be, I, I think that maybe I'm being a little bit too limiting by saying, what's mm-hmm. your favorite character? No, I have what, an answer. What, <laughs> <laughs> what, what are, what are your top three favorite characters that you had? What were the, the ones that kind of oh. resonated and were noteworthy for you? Um, uh, in season two, episode 14, mm-hmm. when her horse, Pegacorn, <laughs> what, what, is, what is his name? He's a rainbow Pegacorn. He's, well, it depends on, on what stage. Do so you he's, mean spirit, he's spirit or and then, swift wind? Swift wind. Yeah. Swift wind. When he showed up, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this. Well, well, swift wind, just really quickly, swift, spirit becomes swift wind. Yeah. Spirits the horse that becomes the pegacorn. The unicorn pegacorn. The yeah. rainbow pegacorn, sorry. Yes. Please get that correct. I'm, I'm very sorry. <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to get some hate mail. <laughs> uh, but you know, From the, the pegacorn uh, community. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, I think an the active I, community, okay. <laughs> I think the horse that you might be referring to is uh, is Crystal Sundancer. <laughs> no, oh, so those are, so I appreciated the appearance of both horses. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was like, that's very smart on the part of the <laughs> She-Ra people to be like, not only is she the princess of power, but she has two ponies. Because <laughs> if, there's, <laughs> if there's anything a little girl loves, and I'm only speaking from my own experience, not to exclude little proto gay boys in Florida, right? <laughs> is a horse. And there are two horses in this episode and it hit some pleasure centers. And so like just I was a She-Ra stan from way back, and I'm going to stick by it. She's my number one girl. Um, any horse you're going to bring into the show, that's going to be number two. So whether that's or Pega, Rainbow Pegacorn or, uh, or Crystal Sundancer, my notes say, so many horses. <laughs> you're not wrong. Um, although I was a bit shocked by Swift Wind's voice. Which is like a three pack a day, like a teamster voice. I wrote down Swiftwind's voice is both deep and terrifying. Say, I can, was, can, can you do a line? Because your voice is very. Is well, little, uh, like, I don't know. It, uh, goes, it both goes up and down it's at like, the same time. Can I try? Can yes, try? please. Yeah, yeah. Um, We've got to catch them. <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> But it's like deeper. It's like less breathy. It's like, oh, uh, girl. I got it. Yeah, yeah, I can. Oh, just like Jabba catch the Hutt. them, she Yeah, yeah it's, it's like Jabba the Hutt um, mixed with like and this Jar Jar Binks, which I don't like. And then also just on a, like having a mental breakdown. It's and, terrible. And like, let's be clear. Swift Wind is a white horse with wings, rainbow wings, and a rainbow unicorn horn beautiful like i had so many notebooks with this kind of like unicorn pegasus creature so many lisa franks oh my parents wouldn't buy lisa frank i got like the mead brand knockoffs and the walmart whatever brat yeah fun fact about Swiftwind: he identifies as straight though isn't that weird what yeah he's in the closet to himself <laughs> oh you don't say yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um uh, yeah yeah he probably has his own leather harness. But yeah. <laughs> I, I think the thing back that's, at the stable. <laughs> I, I think the thing that's interesting is that Spirit slash Swiftwind, mm-hmm. at the end of like the final episode of Shira, actually like has a, a small fowl, like gives birth. What? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this it, is so queer, and I had no you idea. You sent us an email about that. I did, and I read the description, and I wanted to cry. I'll say that. Ryan, <laughs> you I know that you are ready to tell us all about your favorite character. Who wow. is a favorite character that wow, you have? This is a way to make me choose. Um, <laughs> I've never seen a supporting cast like this since maybe <laughs> Pretty Little Lies. Like, this is a cast to behold. 
There's so many good picks from this. I mean, I don't think I can even pick She-Ra. She's not even in my top five. What the fuck? I know. Here's the thing. She makes too many speeches, and I just want a woman to get down to business. What, you don't and like I'm a woman's voice? I'm talking about Glimmer. You don't like a woman's voice, Ryan? <laughs> oh, don't paint me in this corner. Oh, no. if anybody's going to get hate mail for this episode, uh, okay. it should be you. Okay, let me explain myself. Please do. Oh, please mansplain me Glimmer about voices. Glimmer is giving me everything that I've wanted and more she's my number one okay she's reminiscent of a couple different people I obviously Jim. You, you have to remind me which one glimmer is glimmer is okay i, I would love to um so she, she made a huge impression <laughs> on me ryan well, okay oh she's <laughs> the leader of the great rebellion but she's smart enough to know when she's going through things to step down for she-ra she-ra so i appreciate you know what? maybe i would have remembered her if she lost that <laughs> sexy baby voice <laughs> she did have a oh pretty my God. oh he man you're here now are you talking about madam raz right now because no uh, madam raz is a clearly extremely different voice <laughs> <laughs> she's in my top three as well okay. um okay right, so ba so it. basically glimmer is very reminiscent of gem which came out around the same time also by a similar like uh like animation style uh but i feel like she's really inspired by dazzler which is an X-Men related character from, and she actually came out in 1980. So I think there's a lot of inspiration there. Uh, Dazzler is an X-Men, but she has light based powers just like Glimmer. Right. Um, she's also a musician. So she, they basically, uh, Gem and her like basically split up into two characters. <laughs> um, but I, I was really intrigued by her. She was like running the rebellion by herself. They sort of just uh, introduced her in just a way that's sort of like, hey, she's in charge, just deal with it. And she was no nonsense. I really enjoyed that. Um, she was going through some family stuff later, so she uh, gets a little diluted. Um, but good on her for actually stepping down to understand. Uh, Madam Raz is also another big character that doesn't really get featured too much in the first episode or the other episode we watched, but she's a big, uh, mm -hmm. significant character in this series. Um, she's the one that can't quite get a spell right. 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 So, and maybe we can just play a fun game, the three of us, where we try to get a spell wrong and then we say the wrong thing at the end. Um, so uh, she would be like, don't say a peep, uh, turn yourself into sheep or something like that. But she meant, oh, shucks. And she would say, I meant sleep at the end of it. So mm. she would always do that. I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And then oh, uh, it was I, funny because even her her goof ups yeah. seemed to have positive impact on what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, it all panned out well. Yeah, there's so all. many women in this show. Yes, Thank a you. lot, a yeah. lot. It passes the Bechdel test with oh. flying colors because none of them kind of give a shit about He Man. Oh no, they're sort of like, I guess we should let him know things no. are happening. And <laughs> most of them treat <laughs> Bo like he's a dumb nobody which i like because that's sort of what he is yeah yeah I, he's I, I he, Bo is like a dartmouth lacrosse player <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> that like wanders into a lesbian bar <laughs> <laughs> and he's like yeah no, no, no. He's like, look at that haircut yeah <laughs> and it's... cowl is like maybe this isn't your place oh <laughs> Maybe, maybe we go somewhere else, Bo. And he's like, no, no, I've got this. You're like, I'm no. I'm very charming. <laughs> Cal is always ready to give like a condescending look, which I'm always about. Like, I think that's, I think it's great. He's part koala bear, part uh, fucking owl, I guess. Um, and then has a rainbow running through his head. It makes no sense. I, there's so many good characters. They all are ridiculous. I know it's only for toy sales, but. Uh, the boy that bought every single toy back in the day really speaks to it. I love it so much. Um, can we just get into Bo being a gay icon for a little? Let's do it. Go ahead. Mustache. You you have you have the floor, Ryan. I think uh, Laura basically encapsulated it right there <laughs> with mustache. Uh, Hashtag <laughs> mustache. <laughs> so so there's some gay scenes in uh, the very first episode. Um, so when He Man comes there. He meets Bo first and foremost. He's in a hood. He's in a beautiful velvety sort of hood. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just sort of rips it off. And it's he's a big reveal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a real big reveal of like he's wearing full leather. Uh, and he says, uh, well, that man has courage. 
<laughs> and you guys are doing mustaches for her right now. It's perfect. <laughs> uh, can I can I note too that he yeah. has the leather daddy harness, but yes, his does. harness has a heart in the middle. It does. You know why though? Because Bo is a lover, and I appreciate that about him. A lover him. and a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so on the nose. And then uh, they do take a ride together when they actually become good friends. Air quotes. Uh, they do take a ride together on Arrow, the horse. And we're going to pass this gif around because it is like they're riding on this horse. It is one of the gayest experience ever. And sorry for making your podcast a the thousand percent gayer, but the camera lingers, uh, lingers, lingers again. It, it's, it's, beautiful. A, it's a moment where you wonder if filmation is like we're being cheap on a budget or if they're like, we're about to get in some real serious territory <laughs> right here. <laughs> Guys, this is very clearly turning mm. into one of our Saturday morning cartoons. After dark <laughs> conversations that we've yes. had. Yes. Welcome to that territory, yeah. gang. Okay, so I can double down. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so can, there can... is a there is an episode in season one, episode twelve, which uh, it's it's referenced a lot online for being like <laughs> the gayest episode ever. So, uh, Bo goes out. He meets. Why didn't you have us watch this one, Sean? <laughs> That's on me. I uh, should no, have told no, no, you. No, 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 yeah. no. Because because this is this is a great point to bring this up. Is that I don't I don't have that frame of reference. Yeah. Got it. You yeah. know, and so I I would have mm-hmm. never thought, and I I still it, it's it's interesting to hear you talk about this, Ryan, because I mean I obviously I'm not having the same takeaway, and so yeah. like this is super valuable to hear because this is your experience and it's extremely valid and it's great. I didn't have the same experience. So hearing that different experience, that's what makes this perfect. Yeah. Let's get gay. Let's get gay about this. Um, Let's get gay. So, so uh, in season one, episode 12, um, it's called laughing dragon. And uh, basically a uh, dragon is terrorizing the town of who cares what it's called. Um, and so <laughs> the dragon, <laughs> Uh, Bo is desperately trying to uh, protect Adora because he doesn't know that she's She-Ra because he's dense and he doesn't know he's gay is also. So that's a little bit tough. Uh, but uh, so he at some point gets in a pink dress and he comes out like because it's a series of wacky events. And then he get, he gets in a pink dress. He comes out. He talks to the dragon and he says, hey, what are you doing? Why are you terrorizing this town? And the dragon's a little bit, he's got a wacky voice. So he's like, oh, I'm just, uh, I've been terrorizing the town by accident. I'm so wacky. And then he does this movement that uh, he does the gay wrist movement to him. He goes, you know, and it, like, basically he was like, no, I'm a man. And, and it's very jarring. It's, it's an episode about anti-bullying, but it's bullying the, like, Bully, it's so weird to watch and Are they see. Bullying the dragon? Well, okay, so uh, everyone is bullying this dragon because he's so clumsy. He keeps making mistakes, and then the dragon bullies a uh, bow for wearing a dress and being a little effeminate. It's really strange moment. Whoa! Why yeah. is Bo wearing a dress? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, he goes into a house. He gets thrown into the air. He gets thrown into a closet. What? <laughs> oh God! I didn't even catch that one. Oh my God! I feel he, like that's low hanging gay fruit. He comes out of the closet in a full pink dress to accost this dragon. Guys, give which it a is watch. so give symbolic. It a watch. Oh my God! Your mind might be blown by this. Yeah, it's the single gayest thing that I've ever seen. Um, it's 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 really interesting. Um, and it just sort of alludes to the fact even more that Bo is. So gay. And you know what? I'll, I'll keep looking for those instances for later episodes. So I, I, we, are, we are doing an excellent job of kind of talking about this specific episode with yeah. Laughing Dragon. And so I'd be remiss if we didn't begin to kind of talk about some of the actual episodes. Yeah. And so as I mentioned, we have talked two episodes for tonight. We have talked season one, episode one, Into Ethereum. And this is uh, the first part of that five-part miniseries sort of uh, giving you the introduction to Shira and allowing Adore to kind of find uh, her way to become Shira, the Princess of Power. And so, we're obviously not going to do a beat by beat for this episode. And so, really, kind of what I wanted to do is I want to ask: Did you guys have any lingering thoughts or questions about this specific episode? Anything that kind of stood out to you as a as a what the fuck kind of moment? That's what I want to dig into. Yeah, I want to see if we can get to the bottom of those questions. So. 
if you're watching this, it, you cannot help but be struck by the Star Wars influence. Like the siblings, the separated twins, yeah. like enslavement, good people being thrust into evil roles. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's those robots are forever going to be stormtroopers. Yes. In my mind. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. So it, it's always interesting to to note that because of standards and practices during that time, you will notice that at, at no point did He Man or Shira ever really brandish their sword in like a fighting way to actually like swipe at somebody they would throw it in order to maybe knock a weapon out of somebody's hand uh or or they would use it as sort of like a way to deflect uh shots or or stun beams that were being shot at them but any actual physical violence was always done with uh with either like a kick that you would see but you would never actually see the impact uh and this was two actual people like there was never actually any like He Man ever really hitting uh somebody else. He would always body throw or She Ra will always body throw somebody because that's less violent. Uh yeah. but you will see He Man and you will see She Ra like punch buildings, which was a problem that we had in an episode <laughs> of He Man yeah. that we talked about where uh he actually he punched a building, knocked it over, and somebody was underneath it. Uh, who actually didn't have a heartbeat. It was somebody conspiring with Skeletor who didn't actually have a heartbeat. So they fooled He-Man into thinking that he had killed somebody. Oh, no. Uh, which was actually like a great diabolical plan. Mm -hmm. Like kudos to Skeletor. That you really, really show some psychological insight. Yeah, you're really doing a banner job with being able to do the mm -hmm. psychological warfare mm -hmm. for He-Man. But, you know, that's it's interesting to, to note that anytime you would see somebody have violence against somebody, they would use the Stormtrooper uh, methodology or ideology uh, mm. because it was a robot and because you can hurt a robot, but you can't hurt a person. Yeah. I, I think with some of these uh, things that we want to comment on, it's like, was it a budget issue? Yeah. Was it a, a, an animation problem or was it a uh, standards and practices? I, I think it's a little of column A, a little of column <laughs> B and a little of column C. Yeah. Like, I think it's kind of a mix of both. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know, if we do, if we animate one punch, we can probably use it a trillion times more. Uh, if we do one kick where it's towards the the actual audience, mm -hmm. uh, we can reuse that just with a different set of villains yeah. taking that impact. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, filmation fantastically is known for being cheap, mm. and that campiness kind of is fun to see. Uh, but it's hard. Like if we were to watch more episodes, I guarantee we would probably see that punch or that kick over again at some point in time, and you'd be like, "That's that's the moment." where I'm checking out. That's the moment where my brain is like, okay, I don't get it. Uh, one moment that I really enjoyed in the first episode, uh, when they're sort of just explaining the world and you're trying to figure out, there's so many characters and you're trying to really grasp your uh, head around it. Uh, they introdu uh, introduce the witch Sprag. And then they're like, oh, this is Sprag. She's a twiggit. And I'm like, I'm more lost. Now, excuse okay. me? Yeah, and that's all we get. And then she's got a bow and arrow later. It's like very confusing. I lo I love those sort of one offs because I'm like, well, to the internet, I just I picture myself as a little boy being like, what's a twig? It like just like mm. not knowing that stuff back in the day. Yeah, you know what else I loved in this episode is there's also some Star Trek vibes when you have the Adora, you know, before she becomes Shira, like her whole look is kind of that glam, uh, original Star Trek. You know, she's got like a very kind of 60s do, you know, like these little like curls in front, like a bit of a little bouffant going down into like a long hair. When she is currently at this point, she's Force Captain Adora. She yes. hasn't unlocked the She-Ra power kind of within her. Yes, yes. And she's got some, you know, a little bit of a uniform that kind of gives me some, you know, USS Enterprise vibes. <laughs> <laughs> and that, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? A little at, bit, yeah. A little bit. And then, and then Adam... Um, aka He Man, but as Adam, he has some real kind of Captain Kirk lines, which of course I didn't jot down. But you know, the kind of like dry, goofy delivery. Do you know what I mean? I, I can explain to you exactly what they are because I wrote them down. Me as so, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is sort of like a big, long-standing thing for He Man, mm -hmm. which translated into Shira is having sort of like these these titular characters make these sort of like bad quips. These, right. these bad references, bad puns that are not very funny or are interesting. So at one point we have with this battle that's taking place 
in uh in the town of bright moon as the horde is beginning to kind of enslave a lot of the people who are there uh they have Bo, who uh he's fighting this one villain from the horde called leech who has sort of these like sucker hands and so he uh he he goes let her go sucker face <laughs> <laughs> And then we have still lands, still lands, still, good. still lands. St- I'm thirty six, and it's magic. <laughs> Every single judge ten. ten. <laughs> we we also have stick it, the landing. We we also have this terrible moment where you're just like, maybe they're gonna leave it at bow, and then He Man finds a way to fucking weasel and get one in when he is fighting one of the female villains, who he goes, "You're not very ladylike," uh, but then again, ugh. you're not much of a lady. Ugh. And I was like, Scorpia does not need to be treated that way. I'll say right. that. And then she gets thrown into some watermelons. What was that about? Did you see that? There was just a watermelon stand just there. Like one watermelon stand. Yeah. <laughs> that is one thing I like about the filmation. They're just like random shit. Like somebody gets thrown and you're like, oh, I guess there was a stack of crates. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's oh. hay there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, boxes. I, you know, I remember being a kid and watching these shows and being like, why do some of, why does some of the animation look a little different than the other animation, you know, where it's like you'd have the same background and then like this stack of watermelons or stack of crates, they'd look a little different. Cheapness. Uh, cheapness. That's cheapness why. Budgets. Uh, I, I, think, I think probably my favorite part about this is sort of they, they do this, uh, during the battle for, for Bright Moon, they do this point of making sure that you can see that He-Man tosses his sword and Cringer mm. grabs the sword, mm. mm-hmm. and he he knocks. I think uh, Adora's her her stinger gun out of her hand, and so this is the moment that he kind of follows her into that hut, and he pulls out her sword, which yeah. then immediately kind of identifies and says, yes. "Like you're the person I'm looking for." Which this is a fun moment for me because mm-hmm. if I've talked and if I've said anything about cartoons, it's if you are going to leave me on a first episode, leave me with a cliffhanger that's going to make me hit that button to show me that next episode. This is a good one. And it goes out on that line. It goes, uh, you're mine, stranger. You and this curious sword. And I was like, yeah, okay, go, go, go. Because mm-hmm. I, I, now I'm, I'm invested. Like, I, I've seen enough. She's had the power in her hand now. There was a lot of exposition to get up to this point. Yeah. A lot of unnecessary fishing moments with Adam that we didn't really need. Uh, a lot of moments where Cringer's like, I really like fish. And you're like, I uh, get it. I, I've heard you say I'd this. I like some all- fish. <laughs> oh, it's the fish. <laughs> oh, I'm glad it's fish. Mm. How about fish? Although I admire the way that he just sucks the meat off oh, the bones. Skin all in and all. One he go. ate the eye. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Cringer, <laughs> Cringer sucks some dick. Oh. <laughs> no. He I'm doesn't. Cr- he Cringer's is straight, by. and I won't. I mean, claim he gets him at yet. that clit. He just goes. To town. <laughs> oh and you're God. like, please. He sucks that fish. Yeah, <laughs> dry. Oh my God. Uh, man. Cringer has a tongue. Um. I, oh boy. I, I really... Okay, I'm gonna put it out there. Cringer is really good at eating pussy. Uh, <laughs> if anybody wasn't 100 percent on board with what you were implying a couple seconds ago, Thank yeah, you, Laura. yeah, Battle Cat. I don't have time for it. Oh but Cringer? God. Cringer? Uh, yeah. Oh, Cringer's like, can I just go down on you for yeah. 45 minutes? Oh, I feel like Battle Cat's going to, like, he's going to fucking leave. And I oh. feel like Cringer's like, can I can I get you yeah. something? Battle like, Cat only does it doggy style. Because I... <laughs> he doesn't like to look at your face. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> and Cringer's but like, please. Cringer, yeah. Cringer, he's like, go to the gym. Don't shower. <laughs> <laughs> for two weeks and then see me and then yeah. i'm just gonna bury my face right in that cunt <laughs> oh my god yeah. oh yeah <laughs> that is cringer yeah <laughs> oh my it just made me cringer right there <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm bringing that yoni power <laughs> <laughs> to this podcast perfect <laughs> that cliffhanger was great though mm-hmm. i will say like it made me it did really make me think, like, oh, uh, maybe she was. I knew she would turn into Shiro, but it it did give me like the like, oh, this is actually a well developed story. Like, right. we're gonna go on a journey. Mm-hmm. I like that she like had to go. Uh, and spoilers for later seasons, it came out in eighty five, so not spoilers. <laughs> but like, uh, like to see she has character development. He He Man tells her what's up, and then she doesn't just go. Oh, man like she actually goes out she discovers the truth and she comes back and then she becomes Shira that way 
that's so empowering and so mm-hmm. cool actually yeah mm-hmm. she didn't just get thrown a magic sword and like become like become this person like she actually had to like find it and it's a cool arc for like uh there's a later arc where i think her or glimmer someone has like a love interest that's a guy that starts out evil as well and then becomes good at the end too it's a cool arc for kids to see probably and mm-hmm. I, I, I and and to kind of continue this arc and, and and maybe fill in like some quick gaps for it, it it's interesting because at this moment E-Man is like, you realize that you're not on the right side of what's going on. And she's like, no, I've been, I've been raised, you know, as a, as a fighter. And I've, I've spent a lot of time inside of this, this area where I've been fighting, but I, I haven't really kind of seen a lot of Etheria. And He-Man challenges her idea of the, the world and is like, you should really go out and take a look because mm-hmm. the Horde is not on the right side of what's happening. Like you're enslaving people. You're doing a terrible thing to them. They don't like this. She goes out and adventures and sees this happening for herself. And the the spell that Shadow Weaver has on her begins to loosen. She, it begins to sort of like she begins to take mm-hmm. hold of herself to the point where Hordak is like, oh no, we gotta like, we gotta lock her down again. Mm-hmm. We we can't let her do this. And so then in that moment, she then sort of gets the sword again later and has that further realization and is able to kind mm-hmm. of like take that back for herself which yeah. you don't really see with He-Man ever. You know, he's he kind of comes into it as Prince Adam He-Man. Mm-hmm. And that, again, is because of the... It's not because of bad storytelling or whatever they were doing, but it was a toy that they used then to sell, like, to, to have a cartoon to then sell more toys. You know, as opposed to what we've talked about now, which is this was a narrative that was then further used to sell toys, but it was a narrative and an idea that mm-hmm. they had first, which I think speaks volumes about how well this is actually put together and how well it's ri- actually written mm-hmm. and executed on. So, ah, oh, so season one, episode one, it's good. It's a good way to kind of like dip your toe into the water mm-hmm. and it, it leaves you wanting more to, to fill out the rest of those, those other four episodes to kind of see what that arc is. Right. Laura, I know you have some questions about season two, <laughs> episode 14, assault on the hive. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't get what these <laughs> questions are. Cause I, I can't wait to get into it. So this episode has so many things going for it. Multiple horse creatures. (laughs) Yes. Um, We have the credit sequence where She-Ra is in full possession of her powers and she is here. She's possibly queer and you're going to get used to it. Yes. She has a multiracial female like sidekick situation. Yep. Yes. Um, Who I want to say is in for like a split second. And yeah. Then she's like, she's, she's like, episode, take care yeah. of it, Natasha. And yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then the Natasha. Uh, we right find up. out that Katra, who is this very sexy Catwoman figure, is Ooh, a yeah. horde tax collector. Okay. What? There's so, a lot of tax overtones this there, entire series. There's a real Reaganomics <laughs> yeah, situation to here. To say the least. <laughs> um, oh, God, we've gone into the horse thing. <laughs> Um, also, but, I'd like to comment. There's B people. There's B people. <laughs> there's so much going on in this episode. I can uh, I almost give you a time breakdown in terms of what's happening. Yes. Yeah. Okay, go for great. it. Because because there's I need I need a framework. So we <laughs> <laughs> so we have sort of this whole moment where we have tax mm-hmm. collection taking place. Uh, we also have uh, Sweet Pea thanking Shira uh, for yes. for everything that has taken place during this time. We have Skeletor seeing that there is a huge ship and he wants to kidnap this because if you remember, Hordak trained Skeletor in sort of the art of evil. And so there's like that sort of Sith Star Wars mm-hmm. mentee mentor relationship that I they like have. I like that they have no other motivation than evil. Evil, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and taxes. And taxes. And taxes. Taxes. <laughs> taxes are evil. It's Gold. A, it's very Cold them. War-esque. Just so they, gold coins too. I, I love mm-hmm. that aspect of it. So they, they want to use these bee people in order to attack uh, Horde Prime, which is where Hordak is, because mm-hmm. if, the, if, if Skeletor can beat Hordak, then he feels that he can be more superior. Sweet Pea escapes to meet She-Ra. Swiftwin uh, calls on a, a horse from another dimension <laughs> to come and help them out. <laughs> Some more horses. They give chase. Crystal Dancer comes Crystal to- Sun Dancer. Crystal Sun Dancer. Pardon Thank you. you. <laughs> In this moment, there is a high-speed lizard that then attacks them at yes. some point. I want to mention that we are 15 minutes into this episode at this point where these, I think they're called dinosaurs mm-hmm. yes. appear yes. at this moment. 
there has been no exposition. You have just been kind of like sitting passenger. You've been sitting shotgun along for the ride on the craziest train that has been going on because every scene has been has been Skeletor throwing grenades or like yeah. stunning mm-hmm. people yeah. on these bee people, which then they come oh to the God. realization that they're pacifists, but then they're like, we can change them. <laughs> which Yes, is, there's so much. Which is a terrible undertone to have for this mm-hmm. episode of just like, you have your conviction, but I can also change you. <laughs> yeah, they say, uh, in, well, she has her speech voice. You have to fight to keep your freedom. Exactly. And, and, yeah. and all of this kind of comes like, all of this ends like within like the 18th minute of this 22nd or all of this ends in the 18th minute of like this 22 minute show. And there's like three minutes of fucking credits. And so yeah. in your brain, you're like, there was all this setup, And then there's the dot, like you, you hit one domino and every domino yeah. like fell at the exact same time. And you sit there thinking like, why, why did I go on this crazy journey? Like, what, what was the point? Sometimes it's that easy, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to know what to punch. Um, Which is uh, your sister frozen yes. in an ice cube through okay. a window. Let's, yeah. let's talk about, let's oh talk my God. about that. So, so there are a couple themes here. One is you have the theme of female collaboration. Yes. With Sweet Pea and She-Ra. Sweet mm-hmm. Pea saying, thank you so much. And then She-Ra sort of... Then, you know, kind of seeing that Skeletor is attacking their ship and going to save them and kind of pulling He-Man into the thing. You've got Skeletor, who I think is coded as male. Mm -hmm. Um, Although, who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of coded as a little queer, like in that kind of like old-fashioned evil coding. I I kind of always coded him as an ace. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, you think Skeletor is asexual? I think so, yeah. 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 Um I think he's homo romantic though. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, cuz that's his obsession yeah. with He-Man and and with Hordak. Yeah. Yeah. So, um okay, so but Skeletor has my favorite line of the whole episode. He goes, "Back to Snake Mountain." <laughs> <laughs> At the end. Oh man. Uh, but but then you have Hira, uh, He Man, who sort of hops off of this ship that's going to save the bee people because mm-hmm. she was like, "Come on, help me save these gentle bee folk," and He Man's like, "I'm I'm with you." And then they're going along, and he's like, "J.K., I gotta hop off and deal with these high speed lizards." It's he's like purple balls, yeah. Yeah, he's like struggling. There's so many characters, so many things happening, and then he just literally. Just punches them. <laughs> <laughs> well, and well, can we problem can we, solved? Can we talk about what the actual punch was? I don't remember because he says I'm gonna hit so. them with my super Sunday punch, uh, and I was like, "What, what the? Fuck what is that? Is a, the one you do when you do when you're about to go to church? That's what it felt like to me. What is that? Uh, like, what does that even mean? Super and why Sunday? is there Sunday in this universe? <laughs> I, I, is it, it a dessert? It, is it the day of the week? The, There's a lot of questions to the be. The craziest answered. thing that I had is: Do they subscribe to our Gregorian calendar? Like, do, are they <laughs> are they on the same level? As I mean, this? are like, there days of the week named after like the Norse gods, like <laughs> ours? <laughs> it, it, it's 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 very weird to kind of have him make that comment, especially because uh, and. and you guys wouldn't know this, but the, the the one episode that we watched of He-Man was he had a problem because he was just punching stuff. Mm-hmm. Like he was punching a building and it like it toppled. Uh, the, it was a dimensional portal, but he topples this dimensional portal by punching it. Like we had multiple episodes. We had multiple instances in the five part arc where he's just punching random buildings. There's a jail that he punches at one point and he knocks over an entire jail. He-Man, I think. When you the, have a hammer. Uh, Everything yeah. looks Swing like it. a nail. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I, yeah, I mean, there, but, meanwhile, there's a part she, of that that's frustrating. Yeah, and meanwhile, Shira is turning her sword into a rope. Yeah, to let pull me, the beehive let ship me help out this of this person. Yeah, yeah. Well, she turns it into a net yeah. in order to capture somebody. Yeah, she's a beast problem man. solver. She's thinking like really creatively, and and in most cases, nonviolently about how she's going to solve these problems. Right. And He Man's like, derp, punch. That's his whole thing. So true. I mean, I think he means well. Yes, he does. But he, he needs guidance. He really does. And she's, yeah, like, it just paints her in such a better light than him. Yeah, well, and then she's frozen, and he's like, let me just pick you up. 
I'm picking up my twin sister who's encased in ice and throwing her through the window of a ship. Again, and, when uh, you have a hammer, yeah. yeah, everything looks like a nail. Well, and his biceps are as, twice as big as his fucking head. I like know. He's like, I'm... <laughs> and God bless her. She just rolls with the punches. She's like, oh, I'm inside now. Like, she's well, just that's fine what it is. with That's it. what it is to be a woman. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm yeah. so sorry. I will take your apologies on behalf of all women. Oh, God. Just... We're the worst. We're a whole bunch of a he-man just walking and punching mm-hmm, purple balls mm-hmm, in the world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you for the acknowledgement. Oh, I want terrible. to I want to also acknowledge one question that I have for this episode. It's at the very, very end, sort of when they're wrapping everything up, and, and Skeletor has done his back to Snake Mountain <laughs> moment. Why is Sweet Pea mm. wearing a space helmet when nobody else is wearing a space helmet in that entire group of people? I'll answer that question. Great. Fashion. Was that was that what you were going to say? Were we gonna I say was going in that direction. <laughs> God, damn it! She's in a spaceship. Yeah. The the spaceship pod opens. Yeah. She's in her spaceship wearing a helmet, and I was like, she and He Man are out in space, not wearing anything no, on a horse. Yeah. On a horse. On a horse. Yeah. Maybe if the horse wore a helmet, I'd be. A I little mean, bit the <laughs> the okay, cosmology, the cosmology exactly. of Shira is puzzling. I just picture them like godlike beings, and she mm-hmm. actually does need to have some kind of like of Thor. Yeah, okay, you know? that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are elements of that kind of mythology. Yeah, a little bit of Marvel, a little bit she, of you know Norse what? Those gods, could just a little be bit her. of this, a little bit of that, a little dash of salt, a little pepper. Yeah, a little salt bay. <laughs> and those could just be her headphones. She just listened to music. While she's driving or something like right. that. That's yeah. I get Spotify. So she's like, <laughs> I'm going to put on my galactic playlist. See y'all later. But it's a real, maybe she's like Sia, mm. the pop star Sia, who's yeah. o- often like, I don't want people to see my face. She wears like a big wig. <laughs> but also it's like B music in there. So it's like, Bee. <laughs> Chandela B. <laughs> Chandela B. <laughs> yeah. I want to from the chandelier. My final, my final thought and my final question that I have for this mm-hmm. episode is, who the fuck was this creature, this squirrel slash <gasps> rainbow bright character at the very end that delivered this moral of, if you want something, it's worth working for. I don't. I, I mean, I know who the character's name is because I had to research it, but at the same time, like it was. It was it was a weird thing for me to suddenly see. Yes. And evidently this character is in a shit ton of episodes and does this thing every episode where it's like, did you see me? Did you oh see me? God. Here I was. And like, and then the character turns and like looks at you and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. I thought I would... you were being cheap, Filmation. When did you suddenly decide that you wanted to put, was it low key? <laughs> Look-see? Uh, Look-see. No, was it look-see? I have no idea. Yeah, it was L- I mean, I, I thought it was L O O K E E. He doesn't know. He doesn't so know. So I want to know if this company also did the Manchichis. Do you remember the Manchichis? Yeah, they had I those the really Manchichis. high voices. Because the voice was very, it was very VV Manchichi. Yeah. Um, no, it was horrible. It was, it was bad. It really took me out of the oh moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough to watch i will say that Mm -hmm. when they were like i was here i was like i wasn't looking for you and i won't be looking for you next episode he's terrifying yeah that's what you see right before you die that one and he's like hey (laughs) the moral of your life (laughs) (laughs) flashbacks of your life and he's just in the background behind that weird bush or whatever the fuck he was he's like at your high school graduation (laughs) (laughs) You're at some equestrian type of show, and he's like, remember me? I was with that horse. <laughs> Is that Didn't... your birth? Yeah. <laughs> Just like it coming out of the like endearing at some point later, though. He's like, I was the only one that went to your graduation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one who's ever really loved you. <laughs> remember that car with that $100 bill that you got that was addressed from nobody? That was me. When oh. there was only one set of footsteps on the sand. I, I carried would... you. I carried you. Didn't I carried you notice you. my weird... F- like foot paw thing I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh God. I hate to think that somewhere in my brain there are dormant memories of that character. Just I blocked that out. Hibernating. Yeah. <laughs> like where has that emerged, right? Because that'll that comes out. 
all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of those things where you're like, let me review my dating I history. Oh, no. <laughs> Are you more of a, an Adam, mm. an Adora, a Cringer? <laughs> Fuck, Mary kill. Uh, Adam, oh, no. Adam, oh, Adora, yes. Cringer. I mean, definitely fuck Cringer based on your comments. <laughs> yeah, we know your answer, but who are you going to kill? Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably heartbeat, the right answer. In a heartbeat. Yeah, uh, actually, I actually think that that's what mine yeah. is going to be, too. Fuck Cringer. Yeah, marry Adora every oh. goddamn day of the week. I would adore her. Uh, yeah, she's, she is phenomenal. I would like to just issue a statement and retract what I said earlier about me not liking her in my top three because I think I was brash and I thought I was captivated by glimmer. So I want to take that back. Um, mm-hmm. She's phenomenal. And she, you know what? You'll wake up every morning, <laughs> you'll roll over and she'll give you a motivational speech. And then, you know, old, whatever is spirit fingers or whatever the hell that horse's name is, is in the room. Spirit wins. <laughs> well, and then there's crystal sun dancer. Who cares? Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, but you know, just gonna be nice it's gonna be a nice life together mm-hmm. and then cringer will just go down on you for hours so yeah that's perfect yeah a little threesome yeah mm-hmm. Yikes. okay oh <sighs> wow we are i think at the end of shira <laughs> any any final comments or thoughts or ideas um i will leave you with one thing that's Great. homoerotic um so yes. in the very first episode just to quickly talk about it mantana which is his real name Shoots his paralyzing beam at He-Man. Oh, Mantana. Oh, oh, sorry. Did yeah. I say that wrong? I like Mantana. Mantana. <laughs> I just thought you were saying Montana wrong. <laughs> it's my Florida accent. Um, Mantana, you know, Missoula Mantana. <laughs> wow, that was tough to hear. Um, so he shoots his paralyzing beam just at He-Man's quivering legs. It is one of the gayest oh. things. Do you remember like, this moment? Yes. Well, yeah. He's like, my legs. Yeah. I hate to circle back to gay, but I mean, it's if gay. you're going to give me this much material. Just giant filmation. slabs of man <laughs> flesh. <laughs> you need to be alone now. <laughs> I need. <laughs> you turn into the catcher right now. <laughs> oh, these thighs. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that back up. Perfect. My pleasure. Laura, any final thoughts from you? I just need 10 or 15 minutes by myself. (laughs) Fair enough. (laughs) Oh, God. Well, before we get into our actual reviews and our recommendations about Mm She-Ra, guess what? You listening out there. Yeah, you. You, uh, you have opinions as well. And guess what? You love to put them on the internet. And we love to read them for a little segment that we call Love It or Hate It. And so we are now going to turn this over to our longtime friend and listener, Bobby Anthem for this week's Love It or Hate It. Bobby, take it away. This week's Love It is titled A Classic, Nuff Said, and was written by Golden Bame 26 in March of 2002. It says, As a young boy of the 80s, I loved everything that had anything to do with He-Man. When a new show featuring his twin sister debuted, I of course watched it for He-Man and found myself drawn into the wonderful world of Etheria. She was an example of everything done right in a cartoon. It had action, compassion, humor, games, and life lessons. she herself should be seen as an inspiration to young girls everywhere. She was strong, powerful, a leader, and wise. Another comment said she was based loosely off of Wonder Woman. This may be so, but I honestly believe that she was the main inspiration for the famous Xena warrior princess. My friend and I found old tapes of She-Ra at the library. After viewing it today, older and wiser, the stories truly are brilliantly done, and there's even more humor than what I remembered. I recommend She-Ra to anyone who loves action and fantasy. And our hated is not really a hated, but more of a plea. It's titled, Bring It Back, and was written by T. Frybian in November of 2001. She wrote, I have loved this show and miss it very much. I played with She-Ra dolls and my brother played with the He-Man dolls together for hours on end, taking over my parents' first floor home. It is so sad that it left after 93 episodes. Why did it leave? Bring it back. It's so much better than Power Rangers, Pokemon, and all that other stuff. Bring it back. 
perfect as always. Guys, we are on a campaign for 2018 to get Bobby Anthem animated. We've said that we want him in He-Man. I would also accept Bobby Anthem in She-Ra. Mm-hmm. I think he'd yeah. be a great addition as well. With a voice like that, I think he could go anywhere, honestly. I would love him as uh, Spirit Wind. <laughs> <laughs> in the live action. Though. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'd be awesome. So we are now going to get to uh, our, our recommendations uh, about the show. And so what I want to do is I want to extend uh, to Lura first. Uh, you can recommend this show. You can also not recommend this show. And if you don't recommend she Princess of Power, you can also further dip it, which erases it from the annals of cartoon history. I would never dip she How dare you? <laughs> uh, I recommend she I think it is a blast from the past that still is close enough in aesthetics, in storyline, to... St- be, to resonate to a more contemporary viewer in a way that, for example, Herculoids did okay. not. And it's a matter of like a decade's difference, right? Um, so I personally plan to watch many more episodes of she now that I know that it's back on Netflix. Or um, will be later this year. Or will the, be later this well, year. Well, it is for, uh, for the first season that they have yes. of she you can find the second season primarily is on Daily Motion, and then the reboot, Princesses of Power, will hopefully be on later this year from and DreamWorks Netflix. And you can Netflix. bet your sweet ass I'm going to watch that. Yes. I am yes. really, really looking forward to it. Can we make a, can we make a promise to come mm-hmm. back at the end of the year and talk about the new she later on? I thought you'd never ask. Perfect. Thank you also like to be there for that <laughs> done. I, done. I feel like you asked done us to go to prom with you <laughs> <laughs> we do we do a thousand Absolutely. times yes i don't want to wait it's turned into a real dawson's creek over. moment which is beautiful oh god ryan thoughts recommendations on shiro um to wow guys what a journey we were on um to dip it would be and atrocities. I would say ship it. Is that something you do? Um, I'm doing it now. Uh, it was amazing. To to go back to it was so fun. It it does hold up, truly. If you're into leather daddies, <laughs> if you are into just weird uh, custom rainbow glitter animation, if you are into manicured nails for no reason... If you're into weird leaders, you're into weird things that just basically should just be action figures that come to life. I think it's got so much for you. Uh, It's really fun. Uh, There's a lot to make fun of in a nice way. There's a lot to be actually proud of still. I I love it. Yes. Mm -hmm. A thousand times yes. And I will go to prom with you, Sean. Thank you, Ryan. This is going to be a hat trick of recommendations (laughs) for She-Ra because I am also going to recommend this. I think that this did a great job of kind of further extending the template that He-Man created, but also because it had that narrative first, I think that there was a really unique tone and empowerment that this character had because it wasn't relying on just dropping you in the middle of some of this action as He-Man would have done. I think that there was a nice kind of handoff and transition, but then in that transition, you really see a lot of power and influence and kind of coming into her own that Adora has as she's becoming She-Ra. And so even... As somebody watching this as a as a young kid, uh, I don't know that I would have picked up on on all the kind of interesting overtones that I would have noticed. But you know, as an adult, it's interesting to kind of see these uh, and recognize them for what they are. And I, I think that it's awesome to kind of have and understand exactly what that experience is. And so, Laura and Ryan, I want to thank you both for coming on the show today and for for talking about this. This was a joy. Thank you so much for the invite. Yeah, absolutely, uh, my pleasure. Oh. Obviously, thank you both for coming on this show. Uh, I want to then ask Laura, if the good people who are listening to the show want to find you, do you have anything coming up uh, that you would like to plug or any places on social media presence that you would like people to find you on? So first of all, I have almost no social media presence these days. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm You're on, the best. <laughs> I'm on Instagram, and you can request to follow me. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to tell you my handle. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of shows coming up in the next uh, four or five weeks performing with our troupe, uh, Washington Improv Theater House Ensemble Knox on July 7th, 14th, 21st, 28th, and August 4th. 
the show that I'm directing in lieu of flowers has three curtains, August 3rd, 4th, and 5th. People should come out and, and be interviewed by me and Zach Mason and see your funeral performed. It's, it's, it's really an incredible show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we had a sold out run in the last, um, uh, wit production run. Um, on July 16th, I am doing a sort of mashup show with other improvisers at Woolly Mammoth. And then on July 21st, I am, I am for the first time performing in the character show at Dojo Comedy. So lots of opportunities to see me in person um buy tickets i'm <laughs> it's gonna be great and it's so hot outside you want to be in a cold dark theater laughing awesome and ryan where can the good people find you anything that you would like to plug uh so i am also a performer with washington improv theater so mm-hmm. i am on a uh, house troop uh commonwealth so check the website for those dates um and then also i do have an indie troupe as well it's an all gay troupe called ugh um, it's U-G-H, so check those out. Those are also on the website, and we kind of perform around the city, and we usually have posts about it, so follow me there. You can find me on social media as well. Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Ryan Crawl, R-Y-A-N-K-R-U-L-L. And additionally, if you didn't find my voice that fucking annoying, um, I, am, I have another podcast that I am on as well called Homo Superior. It's about everything gay, it's about everything nerdy, and it's about everything gay and nerdy. Um, It's five gay guys in the D.C. area kind of recapping comic books. Um, A lot of X-Men, hence our name, Homo Superior. A lot of, uh, like, TV news, a lot of uh, movie news, a lot of movie reviews, um, and just a lot of gay roundup for the week. And we do it a weekly podcast, so come check us out. Um, you can find us on SoundCloud, um, Instagram, and then also, of course, iTunes as well. So it's Homo Superior, H O M O S U P E R I O R. I had to think about that way too hard. And we will we will provide links uh, to the show in the show notes uh, to be able to check that out. So thank you, Ryan. You heard him on the show, our friend Bobby Anthem. You can hear him on his paranormal podcast, Inhuman Experience. You can find them on Twitter, I E X P underscore podcast and like them on Spreaker and SoundCloud. He's also the occasional third host on the THT Movie Podcast Review, which broadcasts every Saturday night at 11.30 Eastern Time on Mixler. You can also find him on Twitter at Bobby Anthem. Send him a message, show him some love. He's simply the best. As for me, I perform in Washington, D.C. with a group that's called Knox. That's N-O-X exclamation point. We perform with Washington Improv Theater. You can find tickets and times witdc.org. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Paul Ellis. Looking for Dave? You can find him on Twitter at Dr. Claw MD. You can also find his writings, Nerdist.com, Collider.com, and Dave Trumbor.com. If you would like to talk to this show, how would you go about doing that? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> talk to us. <laughs> Guys, you, you can head over to our website, SaturdayMorningCartoons.com. You can check us out on Facebook and Instagram at Saturday Morning Cartoons. Remember, that's morning with a U. You can find us on Twitter at MorningTunes. You can also check out our podcast twice a month now. It's the first and third Monday of every month. This is the second episode before we get into August. You can listen to us on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you want to drop us a message and let us know, or if you'd like a shout out, want to suggest a cartoon, you can actually head over to our link tree. Our link tree is on all of our social media presences. You can actually check out a master list of all the cartoons that we had reviewed. Yes, all 213 cartoons that we have talked about on this show are available. And there also is a link to be able to suggest a cartoon directly to us. We also have a line that you guys can call and you can leave your voice and we'll include that in the episode when we talk about your actual cartoon. Want to drop us an email? Saturday morning cartoons at gmail.com. Guys, that is all for the month of July. Thank you guys so much. Laura, Ryan, thank you guys for being on. I love Loved you. It. I love and you. And I love you. I Perfect. love you. Thank and you guys. It. <laughs> and the movie. Um, and the movie it. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Hey everybody. Thanks a lot for listening to Saturday Morning Cartoons. Now, if you'll excuse me, 
I have to transform and roll out.